look ugly anyhow, so no one will want to watch it. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but we look good. But we could look even more ugly with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's have this different kind of hand and we will turn the lights off. Yeah, man. Today we are supposed to talk about how to make money out of role games, and I'm taking the liberty of extending this this, uh, this discussion a bit. It's not all only about role games, but games in general. Let it be board games or card games, for obvious reasons. I'm not pointing anyone, and uh, um, we will have first a little bit of presentations and. Um, a small introduction and then we will have a discussion and we will certainly hope that you dear audience will be very active ask a lot of questions and we might actually <coughs> ask you to participate over here if we find that to be funny <laughs> so hello my name is Timo Multamaki some of you might know me I have done a couple of LARPs some of some size at least some have ac actually costed something, so I'm actually not known to be doing that much of money out of my games. I'm actually more or less known of losing money in the game, so I have no clue why I have been chosen to this panel, but let's see. So today we will talk about the most important aspect of the game business, that's money. Money turns the world around. We will not go into the art and other artsy fartsy nuances. We will we will concentrate only on the core business. So how do you actually do money out of the games? We have seen examples like Freedom and Freeze in here. Who remember Freedom and Freeze here a couple of years ago? Come on. One. Lousy, lousy presentation, but <laughs> Freedom and Freeze has actually uh, done, well, not uh, exactly billions, but at least hundreds of thousands of euros making board, board games. And how did he do that? Well, he does green products. And what, that, what does that mean? Well, all of his boxes are green. That's one way to do it. You have also seen Koffe, Christopher Sandberg, who remembers him. He was also guest of honor some years ago. How did he do his money or his let's make money out of games? Well, he didn't sell games. He, he told that this is art and sold that to TV. So it seems that games are hard to sell unless you make them green or sell them to TV. So is that so? We will have three panelists who are going to soon, re uh, soon give a short overview of, of their um, background and then we will we will have discussion on how to make money but we will start from Lars okay uh, hello so my name is Lars Kasper I'm from Germany I actually uh, made a lot of slops I never gained money from these slops but I never lost money so <laughs> but uh, as soon as I started to sell LARP as an you thing I made money out of it. Not not really much, but actually it it's a bit of my income. A bit of my yearly income is making edulabs. Um if you were here the last panel, that was my introduction. <laughs> um I um I, I my name's Peter Adkison and I um was a founder CEO of Wizards of the Coast for eleven years. We uh did some games that made money but we did many 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 more games that lost money and so in spite of the great uh some wonderful successes um out of we basically only made money probably with three games magic pokemon and dungeons and dragons and i think probably did about a hundred other games uh that lost money but the games the reason we lost money is because we were a big company and we were you had, we had the overhead of lots of employees and office and benefits and all the things that come with administration. And then you apply uh, percentages of your overhead to your product lines 
and th the point there is that most of the games in our industry can make money only if the, if the size of the company is small enough to be in relationship uh, to the sales, to be less, but the costs are less than the revenue. So I, I think the first point of, of making money is a, is a simple math question, which is what's your sales and what are your expenses? And so the number one thing I would recommend in terms of trying to manage that is, is keeping your expenses as close to, to zero as possible. And what's uh, great about having uh, in the modern age with desktop publishing and the internet and everything else is you can run a company out of your home. So yes, I, I think it's definitely possible to make money selling games. Hey, I'm Jim Raggi uh, from Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Uh, I live here in Finland. I uh, started my game company in July of 2009 and for the past three years, you know, every year is seeing growth in sales. So I'm um, doing fairly well, I think. So. Good. Yeah. Okay, so let's go into the First topic, what makes a game something that actually sells? So what, what kind of game you can actually make money and not lose it? Not going into the aspect of, well, keep the cost slow. Let's start from Jim. Uh, well, you said we're not going to talk about the art, artistic part of gaming, but I think that does have something to do with it. You have to have something that people want. It's got to be something that appeals to them or else it's not going to sell anything. So I think uh, the whole art, the creativity portion, I mean, that, that's got to come first. There's got to be something there to present. So you are saying that art sells? Not by itself, but without the art, you know, you, you need some sort of prior reputation, I think, in gaming. And even if the later stuff you do isn't very creative or artistic, there's got to be some core, some origin, where you've got that reputation for doing things that people like to play. Good point. How about you? So, I, I, I think my answer is very close t to yours, um, but I'll broaden it from art. To, to me, I think the number one thing is, is innovation. Something that's new. And so, to me, I don't think this is a question of category, like board game versus role-playing game uh, versus trading card game. Uh, I think the opportunity uh, to create a successful game company all goes back to doing something that's incredibly fun and new that people haven't, haven't seen before. I think one, I, and, and maybe I'm taking this from my, my experiences with Magic. What I learned with Magic, and, and this is 20 years ago, Literally, next year is the 20th anniversary of Magic. The gaming industry is much, much smaller then. And it was more of a niche in that people outside the gaming industry didn't have so like MMOs to compare to and, and this sort of thing. We were an incredibly small industry. But what we learned is that when you, you do something really innovative, people will open their wallets and spend money on, on something. So I, I think the number one thing, if you want to make money in this industry, is to do something new. If you find if everybody is doing MMOs, everybody is doing trading card games, go in a different direction. Or if, if you, what you want to do is role-playing games, how do you do a role-playing game that is so dramatically different? Now this isn't easy. I'm not saying that this is a trivial thing to do. It only happens once every few years. But, but you've seen these points in time throughout the history of our industry where somebody steps up and has this eureka idea for how to do something that is so radical that nobody's ever done it before, and those become the success stories. Games like Dominion, a trading card game in a box, right? Um, obviously, Magic, or uh, a game, you know, and you know the the list. It's a fairly short list, but but there are examples of this. Uh, when White Wolf did Vampire the Masquerade, you're doing something, a role-playing game, but totally going after the goth market with an edgy art style. It was so new and so radical that they sold lots and lots of copies at, at a time when the industry was much, much smaller than it is today and supported a staff of you know, 30 people. Also? Yeah, I am totally agree on the, um, on the innovating part because I think, uh, yeah, I started organizing labs when there had been 
like 500 labs in Germany every given year. So if 500 organizers do it for free, why would one pay you? Uh, um, at some points I recognize that, uh, so I'm, I'm a trained a uh, educator, I, I work with kids. So at some point I realized if you do lab with kids, people will pay you for that because uh, that's something new. So exactly that. But uh, I think what, what you need when you want to sell a game is you need to, uh, you need to have something else that, than the game because people do not want to pay for play something. You have to sell an image or a side effect or a dream or something like that. So if people, uh, if people feel that this is something that really, really affects them, then, then they will buy a game, I think. So let's ask from the audience, uh, do you buy up these principles? Uh, are you agreeing with what we have said? What, what everyone has said. Silence. Hands up. Yes. Everyone who buys up the, the, the ideals that we have been talking. Yep. Okay. So any questions? Should, should you like to elaborate or disagree? There. Would you like to have a microphone? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there will be a big problem. I can, I can speak quite loudly. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do so. You're doing good. Yeah. So good packaging does help. Yeah, yeah. I do agree. Yeah. So I. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, gets the Innovation Award in 1973. Okay, when it when it first uh, arrived in the market, that that was that was the innovation moment. And and you're absolutely right. Third edition. Well, I I do believe we did a great job with third edition, and um, and and I agree with you. I think third edition is is the game that D and D always wanted to be, uh, my opinion. Uh, but uh, it it wasn't. It, it was we were just taking a, a game that was already in the market and and adding. Uh, a, a lot of great design elements. I mean, it was the perfect storm in that it had been off the market for six months. Everybody was worried that Dungeons and Dragons was dead. Um, it hadn't had a new edition in 14 years. So, from 1985, I think, was when second edition D and D came out, um, to 1999. Nice 14 year gap. The market was really ready for a new edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and we had lots of money to market it with, so we did do a great job marketing it, and we did a great job with the art. I mean, we, we, we basically nailed it and did everything right. So no, but I, yeah, you're right. Third edition D&D &D wasn't a big seller because it was uh, a big innovation in terms of something totally new. Um, but I, I think the question is, uh, if you want to do something new, I mean, none of us own D&D, right? So uh, not even me anymore. <laughs> So uh, if, if any of us in this room want to uh, make money uh, in, in uh, games, uh, and if we don't own a game already that we can sort of relaunch that's in a good position, then it's a matter of coming up with something new. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think um, knowing the rule set uh, is, is some part of it, but knowing the brand itself I think is much more important than, than the the basic rules, because if it would be only the rules, then all of the D20 books would sell equally well, and do they? 
we all know that they don't. Yeah, I, I, I do think that that is a pretty big thing, though, if the people already know how to play, and then here you have a variant that's got, you know, a different attitude, a different focus, but largely the people are already familiar with it, and they'll accept it or reject it based on that, uh, you know, because there are a lot of things that really are innovative out there, you know, a lot of, you know, the indie publishing, they, they do a lot of amazing things creatively, but there isn't the drive to really market it, to really be a business with it. So it's, it's you know, a combination of several things. It's not just innovation, not just familiarity, not just packaging. It's this perfect storm of everything that's got to come together, you know, for something to actually be a success business-wise, I think. So I, um, I agree. I think the um, uh, there's a lot of things that have to... To, to come right. Uh, I, I put innovation at, at the top of my list, but you can be innovative, but if you're catering to, to a tiny market, then, then okay, you're going to be a hero with a few people, which by the way is a lot of fun. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, mind, I, I don't mind that. Um, but I, I think if you, if you want to have your biggest chance of being successful, I would put innovation at the top of the cr criteria. And I would also like to add that you can be innovative in a number of different ways. Um, I don't think Games Workshop was necessarily innovative in creating, in designing its game. Uh, let's, let's go clear back to Warhammer. But it's been incredibly innovative in how it has distributed the game by creating its own stores and marketing, merchandising. They're perhaps the best merchandisers ever in the history of hobby games. Uh, by creating their own stores and creating a template for how they want their games sold and marketed, you know, every 14-year-old boy that walks past the store, grab them, bring them in, sit them down, and teach them how to be a war gamer. Um, it's, it's worked incredibly well for them. And you can, you can debate some of their business practices, but um, th their innovation was in merchandising. Uh, the innovation of Pokemon, which maybe is a bad example because it's, it's, it's really more mass market, but it came out of Magic the Gathering. Uh, was hey let's let's tie it to a, a cartoon series and put a Game Boy, okay, that okay well that that's a really hard thing to do, but wow how successful was it? And so here's an example of a big company applying that, taking something that already existed, a trading card game, and innovating by taking it to a different market and supporting it with a different portfolio of, of market strategies and uh, and sister products. Uh, White Wolf was innovative by taking a role-playing game in, in the role-playing game genre. Vampire the Masquerade was not the most brilliantly designed game, in my opinion, but they, it gets back to what you said about art. In 1992, when that Timothy Bradstreet art hit the shelves, everybody who had any, who had ever wanted to wear a black coat, Wow! This is this is me. This is what. This is this is so cool. And you can argue about whether it was really a storytelling game or not, but they called it a one. <laughs> and um, uh, so, it's it's uh, uh, it, you have to ideally you do good at, uh, on on all the things that are important. But um, I, to the extent that you can target a new market, use new art, use new type of distribution, or do something like with Magic the Gathering, a revolution in game mechanics to introduce a new play pattern to uh, people who like games. Um, that's, in, that's, in my opinion, the, the most important ways that you can increase your chances of success. <clears throat> I just want to add something you just said. Uh, that's me. And that's... Uh you just said in the yeah the black coat thing yeah. that's me so yeah. Yeah. and i think that's a, a very important thing because you i think it's not important to be uh, only innovative it also has to be familiar to people so you have to, to so you need something that it's new but not too new it's slightly new still a bit familiar and people can identify with it and i think that's the point you have to get and i think that's pretty complicated I, I, I can give you an, an example on that. Um, I, I did a board game, as some of you might know, um, about um, it's, it's called Phantom League. And it, it, it was done approximately, exactly 
uh, of, for, for, for the uh, 25th anniversary of Elite, the, the original game. And all of those who in late 80s, uh, mid 80s played that, they were like having nostalgic, nostalgic moments anyhow, and it sold very well. Should I have done that a couple of years earlier or later, it probably wouldn't have sold equally well. And that has been seen many, many times uh, that timing is, is really critical. Um, Did well, you do that on purpose? Yeah, I had the game ready two years earlier, okay. but I didn't have money back then. I, I did some, some Dragon Bane that kind of sucked all of my money for unobvious reasons. Yeah, but please do. Yeah, I, I think timing... I think in most cases where people have been very successful, timing was a part of it. But I'll also say I think timing is very difficult to anticipate. Um, I, I think it's a more of a gut instinct type of thing where if the timing, it's like if you're trying to anticipate, okay, what would be a really cool thing to do now? In some sense, you're... If the gaming industry looks like this and there's role-playing games and card games and board games and MMOs and, and whatever, and you're picking one of these areas and you come up with an innovation to advance that by some... The timing's almost built into the equation, right? I mean, you're not going to come up with an innovation. Hopefully, you're not going to come up with an innovation that you know, was 10 years earlier. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, that already happened. Sorry. Um, that, that, that does... People do that. Although sometimes that happens and, and, and innovation was ahead of its time. Uh, something came out and it, it was too early for whatever it was and then somebody comes and does it later and, and, and makes a, a lot of money at it. So uh, the timing is important. It, I think it's, it's really hard to predict and, and I think the way to solve the prediction problem is to focus on to go back to what's the innovation? What is the what would be really cool to do in this category of games that nobody else has done. And if, and if, you, if you do that and you leap forward, it, it's, the timing was because you were thinking about it at the right time from the right perspective. And that, that this innovation was, was simply the next thing that, that was bound to happen in some sense. You know, it was eventually somebody would have thought of taking trading cards and making a game out of them. Um, and it happened to be Richard Garfield. You know, um, but if he wouldn't have, somebody else would have, probably sometime in the 90s. Okay, as you took already um, the magic rabbit out of the, out of the hat, meaning that you were st starting to talk about the Dungeons and Dragons third edition. Let's go to the fourth edition then. Um, what makes a fourth edition not sell as well as it was expected to sell? I, I had I'll ask from the audience. I, I had nothing also, to do with fourth edition. I know. I'm aware. I'm aware. But this is just like question. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it didn't work as well as it could have because they were planning on rolling out this online tabletop and it was going to be really digitally uh, integrated and the digital part didn't come through so you had half the game out there. Okay, we yeah. have a question up there and then the I'll next, be one, fast. Uh, next comment in the, in, in the second row. And then it's you. Is, is this actually working? Yeah, okay. Yes. Can you pass it on then? Okay, I will. Um, I kind of think that the fourth edition didn't do as well because they kind of lost the audience focus because it seems to me like the fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons is kind of trying to be World of Warcraft as a pen and paper game and they kind of forgot the 
audience they made with the third edition. So I think in a way this fourth edition is kind of innovation, leaving the audience behind or something like that, because Pathfinder has been doing great and they've been kind of sticking to the old form or something like that. It just didn't feel the same way. I, I looked at the character, how the characters progress and I don't, it doesn't look the same thing as I was playing five or ten years earlier. It was just something about it. It's, yeah, you can probably go through a lot of the mechanics and how they were unified too much or whatever. But to me, in the end, the biggest thing was it, it doesn't feel like the same thing. <laughs> I was older when I played third edition compared to Red Box. That's not the only thing. <laughs> okay, let's let's make a simple question. How many of you have spent uh, money on the third edition books? Yeah, well, at the beginning. <laughs> How about the fourth edition books? Much less. It's it. Yeah, well, may maybe there is a uh, reason. I think. The summary is that if, if you are trying to reinvent something, do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next. Um, yeah. There was one more comment. Um, you, yeah. That guy over there already mentioned my comment that that it was too innovative, but um, yeah, my. <laughs> I had a, had another question, but I forgot it. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, this one. But uh, please, uh, may we stop this before it, this whole place erupts in a flame war between the editions? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we will move into the next, the next topic right now. All right. So you, you also um, you are good at drawing these, um, how would I call it, magic items out of your hand. You also mentioned Games Workshop, which has, well, a different kind of practice in making money. It certainly makes money. We have all seen that. How many of you uh, have spent money on Games Workshop? Hands up. Two hands if you are spending a lot. Yes. No. Okay. So many hands. Quite many indeed. Um, but yes, more than we should. Uh, I, I think quite, quite, quite too many have spent too much money. So what do you think? Um, is, is, it, is it sensible and uh, responsible from the games company to, to make products that uh, suck all the money from the buyers and, and leave them <laughs> only with like endless piles of miniatures that are uh, on the next edition no longer useful? If you can get the people to spend the money, more power to you. I just wish they'd spend it on my stuff instead of Games Workshop. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'm, I mean, it, it, they sell stuff. Of course they want to sell stuff. So yeah. it's a company. <laughs> so companies shouldn't have morale in, in that sense. That, that. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, well, Games Workshop and games companies, it's not a matter of morals. It's here's the product, you like it and you buy it, or you don't. It's not like food where you die if you don't have it. It's not like there isn't a hundred other alternatives, you know, but they're doing I, what they do in a field of incredible competition and people still want it, so I don't see a problem with how they're doing it. But I think some people... <laughs> okay, we will in a moment have all the questions. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just have to say that uh, in, in Games Workshop things... <laughs> in, in just one moment, there is one thing that I, I think uh, I would like your comment even more. Many of you probably have noticed that Games Workshop published Space Hulk, the third edition, at some point. How many of you actually have it? Yeah, well, it's kind of expensive-ish now. Um, we, I, I saw three hands just, just, to, just as a reference. Um, it's a whole new way of doing money. How do, how do you think about that? Because they did a very limited run of their game, and now that they are like customers who are screaming that please make a new print run, they have said, screw you guys, we are not. And that's, I think, very different kind of treatment uh, for customers. <laughs> yeah, if, if they said screw you, yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> 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 <No>. <laughs> or did, did they really say screw you, or... Are you feeling, as a customer, that because they didn't reprint it, you got screwed, and therefore you're saying, you said screw you? 
Maybe, maybe. <laughs> There's a very I, important distinction, I think. I have already a copy. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that the, the question, we certainly face this dilemma with, with Magic the Gathering I, at, when I was at Wizards um, with Magic and with Pokemon in terms of, of you have a, but, but the world isn't black and white. You know, there are shades of gray. And um, one of the things that I found challenging about running a business is often you're in a minefield of ambiguity. Uh, it's, it's, you have conflicting priorities and you have the priority of needing to be ethical and you have the priority of needing to make money because um, hey I didn't design a capitalist system I mean that's just the way the world is so as soon as you yes um, oink, oink. As, as soon as you step into the I mean I had altruistic goals as a naive young 30 year old when I started Wizards of the Coast. And, but I realized that the first time an investor gave me money from that point on, I had a, an obligation to my investor. Okay, and you can, you can try and hand wave that and, and wish it wasn't that way, but it is that way. So you're a CEO of a company, your first moral and ethical obligation is to make money because that's the job that you've been that you've agreed to take on. So you do have to balance that with other things. So um, you're asking a company, a, you're asking a lot. If you expect a company to always take the moral high ground and to uh, say, oh, well, let's see, if we printed these expansions in limited numbers and so forth, we, we would make more money. It, it's complicated. And I, I think that, I think wizards, I think when I was there, and I think since then, I think Wizards has done a pretty good job of navigating this terrain of not being as egregious as some companies might be, um, while at the same time uh, doing a good job for its shareholders. Thank you. Um, let's now have the question. Let's start from the guy in the middle with the microphone. Yes. It's, uh, it has a switch on the bottom. It's on. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. And here, Miss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do? Okay. Yeah, now it works. Oh, uh, so, um, I don't know. Well, first of all, I feel that these, you know, maybe, you know, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves discussing the morals of robbing everyone of their money. You know, I think maybe we're more in the uh, stage of, you know, maybe if you start a company, how can you make a living out of it? That's at the kind of the first stage. Uh, then when you have the millions, then you can start, the, you know, thinking about the morals. But um, but I think the uh, the investor thing, I think it's, and in all games and in everything, one of the big things is that you have to want to sell your game. I mean, I see a lot of people in this business, in the game business in, the, in here, who, and I go watch them, you know, hey, we made this game, and then they have me like, they have a, well, you know, to be frank, I don't know if they're here, I don't really care. I just watch 45 minutes of wasted people wasting my time with a game that they, you know, they, I was supposed to go there and, you know, they, that we are going to come up with this game and then they spent 45 t minutes of my time for nothing. They didn't really have anything to say, didn't, obviously hadn't planned it and they didn't really care if I bought the game. And that's like, you know, sell me the game or don't, you know, please don't waste my time with it. And I think that there's a lot of people who, in this business who just don't, you know, they have this like, a screw you attitude, you know, my game is the best game, if you don't understand it, then you're wrong, and well, I'm only in it for the art, or whatever, but if you don't want to sell the game, no one's going to buy it. I well, think were, that's they, my attitude. were they incompetent at doing it, or just not caring? I mean, there's... I feel that they, they feel that they're, you know, they're not going to sell it anyway, they're not going to sell that much anyway, so they're not going to care. I think that's, but I didn't ask them, I might, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, there's a difference in between uh, being a good game designer and uh, the one who sells it. So usually you need more people in your team. I was actually interested in one sort of ethical or moral distinction. Uh, how do you think, easy do you think it is for companies to 
make it so that the products are something that people like to have, that they're happy to have, compared to having products that they feel they need to have, rather, but not necessarily because they're happy about it, just because I need to have this product for whatever competitive reasons or whatever, so, like, because I won't do well in a tournament if I don't have this product, <laughs> and so on. I think that one's for me again. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's you know you're you're cutting to the to the heart of of the challenge we figured out with Magic the Gathering very early on because there's if if it's a construction a, a deck building game then obviously the more cards you have the more um, options you have in in terms of of building uh, decks so there is a fundamental truth to uh to this that in order to be competitive with magic you're going to have to spend a certain level of of money to have the cards you need to compete and so and and i we didn't design magic thinking about that i think i think motives count for something here it's not like we said oh let's design a, this game because we'll make a ton of money because to play the game well, you're going to have to spend a lot of money. That was never our motive. At some point, we realized that that was true. And so we had a choice. Do, do you make the game or not? I mean, really? Uh, and do you hold true to sort of the original vision of what magic was? And that included collectability. It included uh, rarity. And by the way, I have heard many, many, many stories throughout the years of people that spent a lot of money on Magic and then sold their collections and made money selling their collections. Now, I know that's not always the truth, but it, it certainly, um, what we realized is that was what was really important to do was to try and maintain the, the secondary market value of Magic overall so that as Magic would go on, that that if you're spending money on magic, that you, you have a chance of at least getting some of that back. And um, uh, so, and then I think the other obligation was to not sort of take advantage of it in a, an undue way. And trust me, there were many opportunities to do that. One thing that we never did, Wizards has never done, and I certainly not while I was there, and I, I suspect this is still the case, um, was to capture the extra margin that you could capture by holding on to rare cards and then releasing them later as singles. So, uh, and in fact, most of the distribution was, okay, through packs, so that these cards would go to distributors and go to retailers and to consumers. And now, certainly, anybody in that chain could grab product, disassemble it, find the best cards, and resell them at higher prices. But so also could the consumers who were if you're buying an unopened pack, you have as good a chance as somebody along the chain of finding a rare card that's worth money. So, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I think that we straddled that, that fence pretty well. I mean, if, if, if at the beginning of the thing is that, well, it, it's just, there, there's no way, there's no option other than not doing the game is the only answer that you'd be satisfied with, well, then I don't have a satisfactory answer. Um, but um, uh, I think Wizards has done a a pretty good job of, of finding that happy ground because the other side of the coin is the reason these cards have value is people really like playing the game <laughs> I mean the value of rare magic cards comes from the love and fun that the consumers collectively as uh, as, as people that we all many of us have had the enjoyment of playing this game for the last 20 years so um, I think overall it's been worth it and then, you know, sometimes these ethical business issues really you know blindside you when I release my first yeah, yeah I, I haven't had to answer that question in a long time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no the uh, when I released my first box set I was half expecting that to be the end of my game publishing uh, experiment because you know I borrowed money to do it and I, I thought it was it was something crazy to do but it blew out the door and was gone in just a few months. 
And so it was obvious I was going to reprint it, but it was also obvious that the, the volume was going to be different. So what do I do? You know, these 500 people have just bought this box set. And do I re-release it in the exact same way, but because my cost would be cheaper because of greater, you know, volume printing, do I charge less so all the original people, you know, have the same thing they paid a bunch more money for? Uh, do I keep the price the same even though my costs are going down and just basically feel like I'm gouging people? Or do I actually release something different which then makes all the people that just bought the stuff have something that's maybe kind of obsolete, but at least is something different so I don't have to worry about offering the same thing with these price things? And, you know, I... I yeah, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what to do about that because I think the wrong answer there would have created a lot of ill will towards me and that would have made printing a higher amount of the new box set an even bigger disaster than I thought the first one might be. So it's, uh, yeah. I want to add, but my old talking points are coming back to me, you know, from <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't been in this discussion in like 10 years. So, um, it, it, you know, money for a business money is health. How healthy you are as a business is related to how much money you have and your ability to, cre to generate more money so that you can continue to uh, produce things and, and market them and, and, and sell them. And what, what about the games that were great games but were mismanaged and then the companies went out of business? I mean, what, what kind of a service was that? to the gaming community, right? If, if you can, as a company, it's, it's good to make money because then you can keep making the game and keep supporting the game and keep doing cool things like you know professional tournaments or uh, marketing campaigns and get more customers because also the more customers you get for a given game, the more valuable that game is for each customer because they have more opponents to play with and there's a deeper, richer culture around that game. So um, it's, it's actually pretty important to make money. <laughs> Let's take that question. Me? The girl with the top yeah. of the uh, Is it on? Yeah. Um, with all the ethical questions coming up, um, I was wondering how how would you say that the RPG industry is different from the video games? Because I work with video games and I noticed that no one is asking all the ethical questions because it's natural to make money and want to make money and that's just how the business is. But with RPG games it's not the same. Like how, uh, how, how, how are the role, uh, role games, board games, and uh, card games different from, from the compu computer games? That like like how, how do you feel that the, like the physical games are different from digital games in, in terms of how the company is managed? Because naturally there are few, few people well, with well, physical I, games. Well, I think uh, obviously video games are a much bigger market. And I think the bigger companies get, the more evil they get. So, <laughs> on average, present company accepted for, I mean, whatever. I know, not pointing any fingers at anybody. But um, uh, I think what you have is, is um, as an organization gets bigger, uh, it becomes more sophisticated. It gets more in the public light. And there's more money on the table. The more sophisticated the investors and owners become, and it becomes more and more, um, incumbent upon the management to make money. So the bigger the company, the more pressure is on the people running the company to make money. And, and I think the more difficult it is for the, ex the, the CEO or the executive management to protect uh, a sense of morality within the company. And, and, it, and at some point, uh, the management perhaps changes to a management that doesn't care about it. Um, so that's, that's the fundamental systemic problem. Uh, with with bigger companies and and therefore I think video games because they tend to be bigger and I think smaller companies there, there's no buffer between the business people and the creative people and the audience I think uh, part of the deal with the bigger companies getting more evil is that a lot of the people making the decisions don't have to deal directly with the customers that are affected by the decisions 
and actually I think that in, in some of the bigger companies, the bigger they grow, then, then the upper management doesn't actually have to go very deeply into the, into the products that they do at all. So if you are uh, way high in the, in the, in the management, you, you don't have to actually care about the gaming and it doesn't have to be part of your soul. So you are not kind of selling your own soul, you are just getting more money. <laughs> Although there have been CEOs, uh, notable exceptions, like Steve Jobs, yes, right? Yes. Who cared very, very passionately. Uh, I think that there ha are CEOs or product-oriented CEOs that will uh, cut through all the red tape and go right to the product. And I'm, I did that with third edition D&D. &D. I had the design team bypass three levels of management and had the third edition design team report directly to me for two years. And, and so let's, let's assume that then have a, have a heart in gaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even so. Yeah. Okay, um, then let's, let's move to one um, slightly different topic. Um, you, Larson, mentioned um, quite, uh, quite some while ago that um, you would need to have someone else uh, in your team. I think we all agree, all four of us, that um, doing everything by yourself from, from writing to, to, to graphics and product design and, and sales and whatnot might not make sense. So where would you start? Where would I start? Yeah. How? Like, where would you start um, doing, doing, like, what would be the first point uh, if, let's say, he would uh, decide to do a new gaming company. Um, so what, what should he first look for like, as, as an added help? Pooh. Actually, I have no clue because I never had a gaming company. So, but well, I you, think you, if... You if, have a LARPing company. Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> but let's say I have an idea. So we, we have already a start because I have an idea. I think the next thing I would would look for is someone who can who can structure that idea and uh, communicate it to other persons not uh, not necessarily the customers but who can communicate to get other people in the team or to customers though I think that would be a good start from my point of view because I'm not good in that yeah, uh, it just depends what you're doing and what you're good at. Uh, you know, as, as a publisher, I think my strength is writing. You know, I, I'm not a good artist at all. So the first thing I did when I started putting stuff out, I needed artists. You know, I needed to find, and then, you know, at first I was doing my own layout, which was n not a great idea. So you find you need a layout person, and then. You need a good web presence. I'm not good at the web programming, so I need to go to you know get somebody to do the web stuff. Uh, it's just recognizing what you're not good at. I mean, somebody that can do web programming, that can write, that can do art, that can do graphic design and layout. Uh, that's a tremendous advantage right there if you're just starting out, because you don't have to deal with other people. You know, you don't have to deal with their schedules. You don't have to deal with their expense. You don't have to deal with their lives, especially. On a small business level, you know, people's personal issues get in the way. And the more you can do yourself, you know, the better. But if you're not very good at it, it's really best to find somebody who is. Questions? Comments? Anything? There's a question related to the last topic. So, uh, leaving the ethics aside, we know, all know that the collectibles are extremely good business model. Uh, if I look my own background, I have probably spent it something like 100 times or 10 times more money on both games, Games Workshop and Magic the Gathering versus the traditional role-playing games. And I have quite many books. But the question for the panelists is that what are the business models which actually can really make money and generate this type of uh, lively good cash flow for the company? So, what type of businesses you can do in the realm of the traditional role-playing games? Well, you, you identified the best one. <laughs> yeah. Um, as as a as a business, you know, it's um, 
uh, you want high volume, you want high margins, and you want uh, repeatability. So uh, trading card games are, are great at uh, great margins, um, good sales, and, and, and good what they call a repeat pur purchase model. Uh, video games have a similar, especially MMOs where you pay a monthly subscription um, or, um, uh, or where you buy, spend money to buy additions for your character or car or whatever it is. Um, when you leave those models and go, and, and miniatures, obviously, similar things. You know, it, it's a great uh, model there, too, in terms of uh, buying more miniatures. So when you leave that and go into role-playing games and board games, well, then, then you're down to expansions, typically, for board games. If, uh, you know, okay, so Settlers of Catan's a big hit, so then Knights of Catan and so on and so forth. Um, you have, uh, with role-playing games, uh, you know, doing worlds and add-ons for the game. So if, if you want to extend the life of the game, uh, if it's a game that you only buy once and you never need to buy it again, then uh, that customer only helps you at that one point in time, right? So then you, you have to always be getting new customers, which is, is the other business model. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so then the, the breadth of of appeal for your game becomes really important. Like, can you uh, can you localize it to other languages? Take it into new channels of distribution. Take it into other countries um, uh, easily. Can you take it into mass market? And so, it's possible for a game that isn't repeat purchase model or isn't um, uh, collectible or, or expandable to still make lots of money if if it manages to penetrate into a broad market. I mean, I, those are the only ways I know. But I. I and I apologize if that just seemed obvious, but... <laughs> and I, I think I have to add that much that um, I assume that many of you have seen Pathfinder model, uh, which is actually quite well selling as well. Mm -hmm. they, they have kind of a subscri subscription-based uh, role game system, which is, as, as you pointed out, pretty much the only other alternative if you don't sell trade, uh, uh, trade cards. I want to add one thing. I, I know of games that I wish I could spend more money on. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, like, Burning Wheel. I think it's a great role-playing game, although it's very crunchy. I'll admit it, right? But Luke Crane refuses to do uh, worlds for it and adventures. It's a role-playing game. I mean, that's, I mean, do adventures and source books for your role-playing campaign. I would gladly spend at least 10 maybe a hundred times as much money on Burning Wheel as I have if the designer would give me the opportunity to do so. And I would get that much more enjoyment out of it. So what's, where's the ethics in that? I mean, what, what, where's the moral high ground that he won't give me more of what I want? You just need to be a fan of different games like uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess. <laughs> So how many of you actually have this sort of same dilemma than, than Peter, that you have games that, where you simply cannot buy enough because they, they are not producing it? Like, I have similar pro problem as well. Yeah. Hmm. So to return to the topic at hand, uh, where do you find those people you, that can help you with the uh, to help you to produce a role-playing game and uh, sell it to people? Are there any, any specific places like websites or recruitment pools or whatever? What do you say? Well, in my case, I have now um, hired something like 20 people uh, on, on, on and off works in, 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 in my own productions. What I have found to be the best is this sort of conventions where you go and present whatever stuff you do, you do it with a glowing passion and, and uh, like a huge belief on whatever you do. And you will find that there are people like, hmm, I like your stuff. Whatever it is, then, then they will come and say that, but hey, I, I'm a good artist. I know how to draw. Do you, need, do you need drawings for anything? And then, of course, you would be kind of stupid if you say no. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you release something with some elements that are substandard, uh, 
people will let you know about it. Uh, no, but that's that, that's lamentation sucks. <laughs> but uh, that that's bad. Well, it's, it's bad if it's not. It's not bad if it's true. Uh, you know, and so when there's something like I release an early adventure that has a really crappy map in it, you're going to get people to say, oh, you got a little crappy map in there, but you're going to get people that offer to help. You know, I was like, dude, you need someone to do maps for you. I can do maps. And that's, you know, it's probably not the best way to find new talent, but it works. I, I, I think, I, n not to be ordinary about it, but this just kind of building on well, you said it, it's networking. I mean, you, you've got to get out there and promote yourself, promote your games, and meet people and, and be social. I, I think if there's any, uh, if you're not passionate and at least of average sort of social ability, you're going to be really, it's going to be really difficult. But if you can, passion counts for a lot. And, and, and also just keep doing it and, and, and I, I'm glad the conventions idea is still a good one because that's what I would have said 20 years ago. Um, it, it, it still is. And, and, and online, I see a lot of people networking online who are active in social media mm -hmm. and using their social media to, make, uh, to, to become friends and circles up with people who are doing, have a similar type of passion and, and uh, it, it just get out there and network. And it, it takes time. I, I'd say that it's... It's something you got to commit to for the long haul, um, and uh, and it'll eventually materialize. So, um, actually, I'm in the lucky position that I don't have to sell any games. Um, if I get money from from what I do, I get it for my work. But I have a lot of uh, a lot of game on a volunteer uh, volunteer kind of basis, and. Therefore, I totally agree with Timo. You need to um, tell uh, tell people what you want to do, and you will find some people that have that profession or that uh, skills or whatever. And yeah, that's it. And I think there's no difference if you do it uh, volunteer or if you do it for money. Fully agreed. Comments, questions. Or should we move to another topic? I don't see any comments or questions. So then um, we have now went through some, some part of the morals and um, some, some of the uh, like other business models and so on. But then let's, let's move to the next topic that, okay, if you manage to, and now I would uh, kindly ask Peter to limit his knowledge to, 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 to the level when magic was not found out. Let's, let's assume <laughs> that we are all having only small businesses and not billions of euros or anything. So, therefore, um, if you have the small business and uh, you have um, an innovative idea, like we have all, all found out that you need an innovative idea, you need motivation, you need some sort of personal push to, to push your product and you have your first product, what do you do then? What does, what does make that product to be, become a successful that it wouldn't be the, um, what was the, uh, um, Talis Lanta or something like that. So that it doesn't leave on that stage, that it would become the next Dungeons and Dragons or something. So let's start from James this time and then to Peter. And I, I don't know if I'm the best one to talk about this because when I started my business, I had a laser printer that my wife had bought for me. And, you know, I just put up on my blog, hey, I've got this thing. And people would place an order and I would print it out on my laser printer, fold it and trim it and staple it. And uh, you know, that's not much of a business model at all, not much of a way of doing things or doing a release. So, uh yeah, I think, uh, uh, well, yeah, the first thing you need to do is have a plan. <laughs> Not just, you know, oh, I'll get an order and print the damn thing out. Uh, you actually need a plan. You need some sort of publicity, uh, distribu distribution, or selling method. I mean, if it's just, if you're selling it through Lulu, you got to know 
how to promote it or have an idea of what you're going to do. If you're selling it yourself, you've got to figure out what am I doing for an online store? How do I get the money into my hands? How do I figure out what shipping is going to cost to, uh, for people? And yeah, that's you just got to get the just answer those questions with the situation I'm in with the products that I have with what I know how to do. What am I going to do to get this in front of people and get this into their hands once they want it? So it actually sounds like you were doing it right to me. I mean, you, 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 you printed it off your printer, which you got for free. <laughs> you, you didn't manufacture the product until somebody bought it. Uh, you can learn a lot from that right there. I, my, well, way the I would first thing I learned is that with any sort of volume, that's really not cost-effective or time-effective. <laughs> well, okay. So you scaled up from there. Yes, yes. You innovated from there. Yes. But what's interesting about your story is that from day one, you were probably profitable or break-even. I mean, yeah, yeah, you were operating yeah. out of your home, I presume, yeah, yeah. on given equipment and only making it when you sold it. Yeah. I mean, wow. That's a lot of companies don't do that well, actually. <laughs> and, then, and then scale up from there. My advice is, number one, stay scrappy. And scrappy, uh, maybe that word doesn't translate, I don't know. But it's, it's everything that would cost money, try to figure out how to do it for no money. Or as little money as absolutely possible. And, and that... I think for a small company, that is one of the most difficult things. And by the way, I'm not very good at this. <clears throat> but <laughs> I've learned the hard way on multiple occasions. Uh, it, it, it is somebody who has a skill at being at scrappy, at getting people to do stuff for free, <laughs> getting people to donate equipment for free, people willing to help. If, if you have the skill of getting people to help you volunteer for free, well, yeah, it helps. Now, it depends on what you do with that power. <laughs> if you use your powers for good or if you use your powers for evil. Good for now, who? If you use those powers <laughs> for good to create a profitable company that grows and then you eventually turn around and hire those people, then, you, then I would say that you were, not, you, you were a manipulative angel. <laughs> right. So... Um, I, I, so anyway, I, my, I think the, the most, in, in, uh, uh, one of the critical skills, because it's really easy to point at, oh, you need to be innovative. Okay, yeah, we had the discussion and you need to have good sales and all this sorts of stuff like that. Um, uh, don't underestimate the importance of, of being frugal and being cheap and uh, just being scrappy. Being able to scavenge the not only the money, but also all sorts of other resources, yes. Well, I think um, the Finnish LARP community is built on that sort of skills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's happening. Without those skills, I think most of the Finnish LARPs would never have ever happened. Well, I think hobby is a business that doesn't run quite well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, actually, actually I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree on what you said, because... Uh, so if uh, I, I do the labs, I do I do that on uh, as a hobby. Yeah. yeah, but actually I start the production. I see it as a production. I start it like it would be business. The first thing I do after we have the idea and we know what we want to do in a thing, I do a calculation. So the only difference between the hobby and the uh, and the business here is that I don't calculate for the working time. I calculate only for all the other stuff. But if I would do it for business, I just, just would have one more uh, row in my Excel sheet. That's it, actually. And you could do it the same way. So, And as I uh, said in the beginning, I never lost money on that. So... Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're, yeah, you're absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right on that. So it's absolute difference. But the thing, the mechanics, it's absolutely the same. It's just another row. Or maybe five, if you have five people. But 
you know what I mean. Yeah. But but I think there's a an important attitude change that happens. Um, and when you when you call it a business, then um, you're probably more willing to uh, charge money for your customers uh, and and think about the profit as opposed to uh, thinking about just breaking even. Let's, if it's a hobby, maybe you're content to not lose money. In fact, you think, wow, if I could, if, if I could find a way of covering all my expenses and, and, and get this role-playing game out on the market, woohoo, I win! <laughs> you know, um, if you're, uh, uh, and then that might influence your decisions about price point, for example, where if you are uh, in it as a business and your goal is to someday, you know, support your family, at, at this, then I think you're going to be more inclined to say, well, what what really is the highest price I can charge that is still a fair exchange of energy between me and my customer where I am? But what's the highest number where I'm delivering a value that's that's worth that price? I think, uh, Peter, you're absolutely correct that uh, most of those who actually do games for hobby, uh, they charge completely wrong price of, of whatever service they do. They should think in a more commercial terms, uh, and very probably the prices would be fairly different. So, so, so let me give you an example here. What's it cost to attend this convention? 25 euros? Yeah. Is that right? So let me ask you, how many of you feel that you get more than 25 euros worth of value for your weekend here? Okay, so obviously it's priced too cheap. <laughs> right. It, it's not fair, right? It's not fair. I mean, now no, I'm not going to get into it. No, I just opened up a can of worms there. But if this convention was run <laughs> as a business, it could charge more without getting into complex moral terrain. If you just say pricing is should be a fair trade of what is this experience worth versus what what can I charge? And if you set that, if you find a point where it's equal, then you should feel okay about charging that. If, it's okay. a, if you're a business. Okay, we have a couple of qu questions. Uh, let's start from the guy over there, and Dr. then it's Tyler. you again. So, what was your uh, hourly wage then? Well, it's especially the, tr the transition. I, I, I agree with you for the window of the transition. So. If a business, we shouldn't make this so personal having to do with this convention, but if, if, a, if a convention out there suddenly <laughs> goes from being a not-for-profit to a for-profit business, there's probably this point in time where it makes that change where it's very difficult for, because everybody who's volunteering has to go through this now mental re-examination and say, um, is this still worth it for me? Am I getting, what was it that I was getting out of this experience? Um, and am I still getting that? Or am I still, you know, I mean, I, I run Gen Con for profit, and I get, I have lots and lots of volunteers. So I would say that the experience of volunteerism does not always rely on the people you're volunteering for uh, not making money. And I, I mean, I, my own experience totally disproves that. But making that jump um, is, is complex. Um. I want, I want to uh, second that. So in, in actually in, in the gym, in the big labs in Germany that are from like 5,000 to 10,000 participants, uh, there is actually companies behind that and they actually make money out of that. Um, sometimes not direct money, but uh, it's, it's of course all these lappers have to buy stuff and they have shops, so they make uh, secondary money. But they have lots of lots of lots of people volunteering there. And they still do it and have fun, but still some of those people who do that, who run, who run the business, make money out of that, live from that. Hey, and lots of role-playing game companies, they've got people that are willing for free to demo you know the company's games at their local game store and it's all for the purpose of helping the profits of the company and they're volunteering for it anyway without expecting you know wages for it so it that happens across the board I, I mean you are right there are people who would choose to no longer volunteer for a for-profit company there are people who will say 
the reason I'm okay volunteering because the organization that I'm volunteering for is a not-for-profit. But my, my only point is that that's actually a much smaller percentage of the population than you might think. And uh, I, I, from my personal experience, can say that um, uh, the, the amount of free help that you, you can actually receive um, doesn't seem to be in any way uh, like proportionate to, to whether you make profit or not. Because, well, I have, I have experiences on, on uh, different kind of cases, and it seems that there is always enough people, uh, if, if you are just passionate enough in, in the advertisement of, of your whatever you do. Yeah, and I think we come back to actually our first topic here. If you have, uh, if your product that you want to sell to those volunteer workers is uh, familiar enough and innovative enough, then you can sell it to them. You don't actually sell it to them, but you can get volunteer work if you have a product that they think is worth to do some work for. Yeah, this is a really good topic because uh, small companies and big companies alike rely extensively on volunteer labor. So um, I think it's worth keep going. The, um, you have to understand, you'll have trouble managing volunteers if you are always thinking about money and how you have a bit, let's say this applies in a business case. Say, let's say I'm trying to create a business and trying to make money. Uh, and if, if you're thinking always that these volunteers are not going to want to help you because you're making money and they're not, um, then you're not really appreciating why people volunteer. And I, I think people volunteer in many cases to be a part of something that's bigger than any of us are individually. And I think about, I think about Gen Con, which I'm very proud of. I love this convention. I've been going to, to it for 20 years. And the, I know that the people who volunteer for Gen Con do it because it's a chance to be on the inside of, of something that's really important. And that most of us, when we go home, I mean, I'm not really doing anything important these days other than Gen Con. I mean, I'm starting a new web series, which I'll talk about tomorrow, but it's not important yet. <laughs> and so Gen Con is, is what I'm doing important. And uh, I really get a lot of satisfaction out of doing that and being a part of that. And I know that not only do I, but every single person that volunteers at Gen Con, it's the, pr the, the pride for wearing that Gen Con t-shirt and providing uh, something, an event that for several thousand people is the best four days of the year. Um, I have to add in here that uh, I, I personally believe also that the, uh, when, when, whether it's a convention or, or a company, when it grows to, to certain size, when the, the amount of volunteer uh, work is becoming larger and larger, you actually have to have a professional staff to, to like direct the voluntary work to, 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 to some meaningful direction. We had in Dragon Bane the problem that that was 200 man years work, and uh, we had 450 volunteers and no paid um, like overseers, and that was not easy task to manage in any way. And would have been much better if, should we have had, let's say, five full-time uh, employees taking care of all of the volunteer work. Then it would have been directed constantly at the correct direction and you would have been able to gain much more out of the same amount of work, which would have been better for, for the people who did the work and also better for those who actually enjoyed the en end product, meaning the LARP. Thanks. Yeah. So, so I have one thing I want to add. If, if in spite of everything I've just said, you still worry about this, because in spite of everything I just said, I, I do worry about this. Like, I know that my business relies on having about 500 volunteers. I, also, I know if I paid them a fair market wage, I wouldn't be able to be in business. So I do know that I'm, I'm, I need to do that. So the last point is that how do I solve this in my own heart is that I volunteer for another organization. And so every year, uh, every year I go and help build a city out in the middle of the desert called Burning Man. I, devote many hours of my time and have been going almost every year for like 12 years and in that event it's another event in that event I'm a peon 
who goes early and helps build the city. And I, I don't even know the people that run it. I just know the person right above me. And, uh, and I la labor tirelessly uh, to, to help that event go off well. And I'm really proud of it. I'm really happy to do it. I'm really glad to be on the inside of, of Burning Man. So maybe there's a, maybe at the end of the day, you can, uh, the, the karma is, is a pay it forward sort of karma. I, I also think it's a good thing to have one, two, five, how many ever, people who are paid and who, who take care of the volunteer workers because you won't wear worn out them that fast. Because that's something I experienced, that if you have a lot of volunteer workers but you have no one who is, who is giving instructions and stuff like that, they worn out pretty fast because they do way too much work that is for some kind pointless because five people do the same work or think they do the same work or stuff like that so uh, sometimes it's clever to have someone who, who, want, who takes care about that and if this one is paid it's not a bad thing so we have questions yes yeah so uh, <laughs> um, when thinking about how much to charge for a role playing game you have you have to define whether role playing games and other games in in general are art or products so um, because many people seem to seem to think that that games in general are more about creativeness and art, but when you wanna really want to make make money out of them, you have to think about them as products, right? So where do you where do you draw the line? What do you think about do you think of uh, do you think about uh, games as art or products? What's your opinion? Oh. Okay. Say, so, for me, it's pretty easy to answer this question. It's art as long as I work on the idea and things uh, around the idea. And as soon as I want to sell it to someone, it's a product. Even if it's a volunteer project, but I still want to sell because still people will pay for that. And I will make an offer. And if, if the price suits to the offer that's not the problem of the customer that's my problem and if my volunteer work is not paid that's my problem not the customer's problem so if i make an offer i have to bring this fulfill this for the money they give me whatever it is so in this moment it becomes a problem uh, a problem <laughs> sorry <laughs> a product for me <laughs> yeah it's Art until the point where you're ready to sell it to someone. That's that's how I see it. You know, when putting together the art and the writing, it, it, it's all about the creativity. How do I make this the best I can and something that satisfies me and that, you know, that I hope other people will like. That's the whole point of the whole thing. Uh, but it be, really becomes a product to me uh, when I have to put that, you know, suggest manufacturer suggested retail price on it. That's the point when it becomes a product, when, you know, I tell the layout guy, here's the ISBN that has to go on the back of the book. That, that's when it stops being the creation and the art, and it becomes the product that's going to hopefully be on tons of store shelves. Um, I, I, I think you have to go back to the earlier question, or, or, is it a hobby or is it a business? And so... I think if it's a hobby, then it can be mostly art most of the time to the extent you want to recapture your costs. Um, if it's a business, then I think it was, it's a product from the beginning. Um, I think um, if, if you want to be in business, um, you better think of it as, I, I would say, you think of it as art only to the extent that that uh, is supporting your business objectives. and. Now, that doesn't mean art isn't important. Art is, an, is a component of the product. And 
But there's some products where the art's not that important. There are other products where art's incredibly important. Art was crucial to the launch of Vampire the Masquerade in 1992. The Timothy Bradstreet black and white illustrations and the cover that was on the original book was just mind-bogglingly beautiful when it came out. Art was crucial to Magic the Gathering when we launched it. But it was also an, a, a business objective from the beginning where I told Richard Garfield we should do a card game that has color art because I think I can get color art for cheap and people aren't seeing as much color art as is being made. So it was integral to the business analysis. So I, I think if you're in it to make, if you're in it as a business, then the art is, uh, is secondary. It, it's to whatever extent it supports your business goals. Okay, we are soon about to run out of time, so I think uh, we will have um, the last round of, of like comments. We will reserve the last 10, 15 minutes, and um, then we'll be, we'll be done with it. So we have a question in there. I think I asked this a few years ago once, but it's very much on topic for this discussion. Uh, board games and figure miniature, miniature games, collectible card games, all that, um, they're, I, I, in a way, I think they're a lot easier to sell. But one of the big problems, I've, and I've been thinking of this for years, is how do you sell role-playing games, aside from modules and more world books and that, when the integral part of using it is your imagination and your ability to create stuff. So when you have that basic core book, how are you, <laughs> isn't there a sort of um, integral paradox in trying to sell more things when the imagination of all the players and the uh, game master is that they can always create more themselves? Uh, there's a, a great, one of my favorite quotes of Ryan Dancy, and, and by the way, he has a lot of great quotes. Uh, he was the magic businessman, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons business man manager after we acquired uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, he, he once commented that the challenge of of being in the in the Dungeons and Dragons business was that the most important part of the game you couldn't put in the box. To so the the game master, right? So yeah, you're absolutely right. That is a frustrating uh, challenge of being in the role playing game business. But. <laughs> But cre uh, you know, creativity and that imagination, it, it deals with inspiration. I mean, the greatest musicians in the world listen to other music. You know, the best writers in the world, they read other novels. So, you, you know, yeah, you can be very creative, creative and do the stuff you do for your home group and never have to buy anything. But there's always inspiration to get from somebody else. I think that is, uh, I was actually, it kind of ties into my comment that, you know, when I buy, buy something about the art and product thing, but it, it's the same with this thing. When I buy something, I want a good product. I mean, I don't buy art. I buy, when I buy games, I buy products that I can use. And I think that's a big part. I mean, I consider, I mean, I hold talks on how to game master. So, you know, I have to consider myself a very good at it. But, you know, good products make it easier. They have, they have good mechanics. They have all sorts of ready to use stuff. And just, you know, they're just, you know, like, you know, I can be the best driver in the world, but if, if I don't have the good car, I'm not going to win any races, you know. It's the same with games. If you have a good game, then, you know, my skills as a game master, you know, uh, with, combined with a good product that has, that's what, all you know, well done, it's inspiring, it has good mechanics, it's easy to use because it's well indexed and everything like that. It, it, that makes the whole game good. So it's, a, you know, it's not... I don't buy art, I buy products. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I think that even if something has all of the, the technical bits, you know, the index, the, you know, X, Y, and Z, w without that creative spark in it, it, you know, it's, is it really still useful to you? I mean, I, I think at the core, you know, all these other things that make something a product, it helps it be used. It, it really is essential. But in, in the core, there's this thing, this big A art, you know, that somebody had there that makes the rest of it that's around it useful in the first place. Yeah, I think, but it, I, think I, I would go that it's, yeah, it's just one part of it. You know, it has to be there. Otherwise, it's not a good product. Otherwise, it doesn't 
all go together. It's kind of the thing that holds the game together. Yeah. You know, if, if there has to be some point to using this, these specific things together. But we had another question there. I, I would say, I, I, <laughs> I want to say that even though I, I, I'm often very cautionary, things like be scrappy and small industries and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm also a, an optimist in that I think role-playing games are uh, the most amazing entertainment form that's still in search of a business model. So I, I think that the, I think somebody's gonna make a killing at role-playing games someday because they're gonna figure out a different way to monetize it. And they're just, just gonna figure out, listen, people are willing to spend a certain amount of money for a great experience, okay? so. Um, I, and I, I don't know, how, how many euros does it cost to go to a movie here? T 10 euros, let's say? Uh, okay, so if, if you're willing to pay 10 euros to go to a movie every time you go to a new movie, um, you should be, I, I don't know, I think role-playing games are way more fun than a movie. I, I think you'd probably be willing to, pay, to spend 10 or more euros per role-playing session. But you're probably not, right? So if you have five or six people, what I'm saying is that your willingness to pay the money if somebody could provide you that value is there. You would still, you, you might resist the idea of spending what you're spending now to spending what to that amount of money. But maybe you would if, if, if you felt the value was there. You certainly enjoy the activity enough, right? So, uh, Instead of thinking about what the new role-playing game is, think about what the new role-playing business model is. And by the way, we should want you to do that because then role-playing games will, as an industry, will make more money, have more money, have more customers, will be a healthier industry. What did I say earlier about in business world, money is health. So I think it would be a win-win for all of us if somebody figured out how to make more money at role-playing games because then we would have more role-playing business. Yeah, but the argument we run into is the people that say, you know, the industry is not at all important. We don't need them. So you say... It's you know, bullshit. I, the, in, you know, the, the industry I, is really important. And I'll tell you, okay, okay, well, okay this you're, convention... You're, you're better Cox, to explain that than I am. I'm not jumping on you. I'm sorry, but I'm passionate <laughs> about this. And here, here is why... Here's what I want to say. Okay, I run the biggest convention for tabletop games in the United States. What's the number one activity at this game? Role playing. Yes. No. The biggest activity at Gen Con is role playing. Okay, it's bigger than board games, it's bigger than trading card games, it's bigger than miniatures. miniatures. But those three categories are all much bigger industries in terms of how much money they generate. Okay? So role playing games are really important. They're way more important than people think they are because people judge the value based on the sales levels that they see and, and so on. But when it comes to what people are actually doing, they're playing role-playing games a lot more than you think they are. At least in America. I can't speak to Finland. In Finland, you guys are doing this thing called LARPing, which I don't understand. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but Timo's been teaching me and then Larson steps in when he is... Uh, so. The, that's the good news here, is role-playing is very much alive, it's very desirable, it's very fun, and by the way, it's getting better. The, the experience of playing role-playing games is getting better, because there are now more, I would say in the last 10 years, there has been an increase in the intelligence of the people designing, in, in the intellectual aptitude being applied to designing role-playing games has gone up considerably. The, the designs that are coming out of role-playing games are much more interesting in the last 10 years than the previous 10 years. Okay? Um, people are really pushing the boundaries of what makes a story game. And, 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 and Scandinavia has a lot to be proud of here, too, um, as we hear from the U.S. So the experience of role-playing games is getting bigger, is becoming more and more relevant, is becoming more and more interesting. It's just somebody needs to crack the business model, figure out how to make the role-playing industry healthier because the demand is there. The customer demand is there. And that's the good news. And somebody, by the way, will figure this out. Now we all know that uh, to make something properly, you need people to work like full time and full heart to do it right. 
and then they have uh, family to feed on, you know, kids and stuff. But um, I have been cherishing this idea that maybe if you could um, make your uh, family fed through a donation-based uh, kind of business model, do you have anything uh, on this? Like, you know, the success of many great uh, Kickstarter and crowdsourcing projects, and all of you have uh, this, you know, this idea that giving something back, like uh, the man there <laughs> with his city project <laughs> and such. So if you have anything maybe on this one. Yes, um, certainly. Um, I, I guess you, you were not here a couple of years ago when Greg Stoltz was here and explained how, how, how does he actually feed his family through Kickstarter projects. Actually, I wasn't. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, uh, to, to recap the memories uh, from a couple of years ago, yes, there are some people who actually do that, but it's, it's damn hard uh, and it, it requires some, some previous uh, successful projects in some other methods. If you are doing your very first project as a Kickstarter method uh, and you, you are aiming to, to feed your family through that, well, good luck. <laughs> Uh, since you brought it up, I would just say I think Kickstarter has been a really, really positive force for gaming the last couple of years. It's enabled a lot of great projects to get to market. And, and, and maybe someday it will come to Finland as well. Yeah. Oh, it will. It doesn't work well, in Finland. The yeah. equivalent will. Yeah. Well, well, there is, yeah. there is, uh, yeah, there, there are some services, some crowd funding services you can use here. I, I use Indiegogo, but I have to say the interface and how that works, it's really inferior to Kickstarter. I mean, Kickstarter, not only does it have the, uh, the, the, the you know, mind share of the people, you know, people <coughs> associate with uh, Kickstarter and not necessarily other websites, but their whole interface and how they work is so much better. They need to come here. <laughs> But we had a, another question there. I, I, I don't think that's the issue because I think, uh, I, know, I don't know how common this is in Finland, but in the States there are so many uh, stereotypes about gamers, about these people that are just not right in the head and you know, just these stupid people. And what do they do? They game, role-playing games. They ruin other people's games. And, you know, if these people are deep into it, I don't think it's anything having to do with being intelligent or active or anything that allows you to get into gaming. You know, I, I think a normal person could fit in quite well without having a problem. So I, I, I think there's an assumption in your question that I'd like to challenge. If uh, You're um, saying that maybe role-playing games, if, if I understand, have a limit as to how big they can get because they require being active. I'm, I'm not sure they do. I mean, maybe it's possible to be passive and uh, be part of a role-playing game, perhaps by watching a role-playing game that's happening through media. I mean, this gets back to what I was saying about rethink the business model. You know, don't, don't lock yourself into this is the business model. You make a book and you sell it to distributors and, and friend people on Facebook. I mean, you know, rethink what the business model is. Um, it, it's, if, you know, I'm making money, I guess, at role-playing. I just realized this. I'm making money in role-playing games by running a convention that hosts role-playing games. So um, think about the whole experience of role-playing. And if you, and, and since this seminar is about how to make money at role-playing games, let, let's, let's assume it's okay to think that way. <laughs> if what you want to do is figure out how to make money at role-playing games, think about the whole experience of, of, of role-playing games and how you can fulfill the, the big demand that's out there for experiencing it. And, it's, it, and the answer may not be publishing another role-playing game. I mean, there might be enough role-playing games out there already. I mean, there's quite a few. <laughs> do you think publishing one more is really the answer? I don't know. I haven't published a role-playing game in a long time for that reason. Okay, we will have time for two more questions, and then I think we are pretty much done. So we have one in there, and do we have another one? 
Anybody different? <laughs> Anybody different? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm always very talkative. Um, I think uh, I just this is again more of a comment than a question, but uh, about the you know how to make money with role playing games. I think a good example is the uh, Korean. I don't know which game is that they play uh, the TV game. What the? Yeah, StarCraft. Yeah, I mean there is a huge business, you know, where people watch on TV other people where other people play play games. And there's also a huge business on people watching on TV when experts play poker. And all this weird stuff didn't exist a decade ago. And, uh, and there's no reason that, you know, there couldn't be other things. It could be, you know, maybe it's not TV, it's not the movie, but, you know, there's ways to, com I think, that just an examples of stuff that, you know, sounds like, you know, would have sounded absurd 10 years ago, and now it's, you know, everyone knows that it's, it's there and no one questions it. Come to my panel tomorrow night. Yeah. Role-playing games as visual media. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't think that it's, it's that far-fetched that that will happen um, in in nearest future. There has been already yeah. quite some many experiments uh, on, on, on how, how to, like, Take, take the media um, in, in a very different format than, than it is at the moment. But yeah. like Peter said, rethink the business model. Yeah, yeah the crew from the uh, tabletop uh, web show playing Fiasco got a huge reaction when they did that a little while back. Yeah. I, I think the most, as far as I can tell so far, um, it's only July? Are we in July? Still, yeah. Uh, it's only July, but so far I think the most important thing that's happened in the tabletop games industry so far in the year 2012 is Will Wheaton's uh, tabletop web series where he's broadcasting tabletop games and he just did fiasco I mean that is a that's a, a niche game I mean it's the leading story game perhaps yeah, but yeah I, I've also got to speak up for my guy uh, Zach Smith uh, yeah I hit it with I, my axe web show you yes know, that, that was I agree yeah. and and uh, Zach Smith was uh, nominated for a Diana Jones Award this year. I published for... that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so I think it's it's time to give a big hand for the panelists. And... Thank you. Thank you for your time and you. patience. Uh, money rules the world. Thank you. <laughs>